This is BBC World News America reporting from Washington. I'm Regini Vaidyanathan. The political lines are drawn over the shutdown. Democrats and President Trump square off with warnings of how long this may last. He said he'd keep the government closed for a very long period of time, months or even years. We won't be opening until it's uh, solved. We think this is a much bigger problem. The border is a much more dangerous problem. It's a much bigger problem. It's a problem of national security. Diplomatic pressure rises on Russia as Paul Whelan, who denies accusations he's a spy, seeks help from a number of countries where he's a citizen. <laughs> During World War I, they brought jazz music to Europe. Now, a century later, the leader of the Harlem Hellfighters Regiment is getting new recognition. Welcome to World News America and week two of the partial government shutdown and there's still no sign of compromise from either side. Following a meeting at the White House, both parties took to the microphone to lay out their case. Democrats said opening the government was key to them resolving their differences, but President Trump stressed that a barrier at the border was an issue of national security and worth fighting for. Add to that a fight over the mention of impeachment and 2019 is off to a flying start. Well, the BBC's Aline McBall has been following it all. Looking in, it might appear to be business as usual at the White House, but it's far from it. For two weeks, government has been shut down. The Democrats won't agree to sign off on $5.6 billion for a wall along the border with Mexico and Donald Trump is refusing to back down on his demand that they do just that. The southern border is a dangerous, horrible disaster. We've done a great job, but you can't really do the kind of job we have to do unless you have a major powerful barrier, and that's what we're going to have to have. While there's no agreement, 800,000 government workers are not getting paid, and many government departments and services have been suspended. Opposition leaders met Donald Trump today to try to resolve the crisis, but said they found a man who was uncompromising. So we told the president we needed the government open. He resisted. In fact, he said he'd keep the government closed for a very long period of time, months or even years. But Democrats themselves are not yielding. They've been emboldened after the swearing in this week of new congressmen and women that now give them the majority in the House of Representatives. Among the freshman politicians who'll be a thorn in the president's side was one of the first Muslim congresswomen, Rashida Tlaib, always seen as someone representing a more combative, brash opposition. But few expected she'd steal the headlines as she did, talking about the president at a Washington reception. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach... Those comments provoked Donald Trump. Using language like that, I thought that was a great dishonor to her and to her family. But what of that question of impeachment? Well, you can't impeach somebody that's doing a great job. That's the way I view it. Thank you very much. There's no question this week, though, and a resurgent Democratic Party has ushered in a new, more turbulent and divisive time here. Aline McBool, BBC News, in Washington. Well, for more on the political standoff, I'm joined now by Reid Wilson, a correspondent for The Hill. Reid, thanks for coming in. Lots to unpack. <laughs> Let's start with the ongoing partial government shutdown. You've got President Trump saying the meeting with Democrats was productive. You've got the Democrats who are saying it was contentious. Who's going to budge, though? That's a fascinating question, and I think it gets to a microcosm of what we're likely to see over the next couple of years. President Trump is a guy who likes to talk about his uh, capacity for making deals, making deals that are good for the country and good for his his business as well. On the other hand, he has also taken a liking to fighting. The political fights that got him in the into the race in the first place won him the Republican nomination and ultimately won him the White House. So at this moment, when he can choose to fight or choose to make a deal, which is he going to choose? So far, he has chosen to fight. It looked like there was a deal uh, before the government shut down. President Trump moved the goalposts, and now here we are in, in week two of a shutdown. I don't see any reason 
reason why he would budge, especially because a lot of the new people around him, including his new chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, look like, I mean, they are the hardliners who have been pushing for this kind of wall, and frankly, they don't mind a little government shutdown now and then. Um, on the other side, you've got Democrats who have no reason to back down either. They clearly have the political upper hand at the moment. It's not as if you're going to get, you know, 218 members of the House of Representatives, which would include at least 30 Democrats voting in favor of money for a wall. Uh, that's just not going to happen. That's not how the House of Representatives work, uh, especially now that we've got this new Democratic majority that's much more progressive uh, than the even the last time Democrats controlled Congress. And much of this, of course, comes down to the president wanting to build that wall. Mm -hmm. We're hearing today that he's possibly considering using presidential powers to get the funding without Congress's need uh, and actually go ahead and build it. Now, how likely is it for that to happen? So I think that's very unlikely. What it appears that the president might be able to do, uh, although there is some question even within uh, the Pentagon and, and sort of experts in government spending about whether or not he could do this, is use some money that has been funded to the Department of Defense to build a section of wall based on land owned by the Department of Defense. Now, that's about 100 miles. The border is 2,000 miles. So if he, if he did that, he'd get about 5% of what he wanted. It's not entirely clear, though, that he can do that because the money has already been appropriated for other things. So this, this notion of a national emergency gives him a little more flexibility. But the fact is they're on pretty shaky legal ground, and you can guarantee that Democrats would take the president to court over whether or not he could actually do this. So this could just be talk coming from the president. Speaking of other talk, mm -hmm. uh, profanities in fact. We saw in that report there uh, a freshman congresswoman, Rashida Tlaib, uh, use a profanity but actually mm -hmm. she was saying she wants to impeach Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, how likely is impeachment now you have the Democrats now controlling the House? So I think impeachment is, is a conversation that needs to happen in two phases for House Democrats. First of all, right now, the House leadership does not want to talk about this. They wish Rashida Tlaib had talked about how great it was to be a member of Congress and all the things she wanted to do rather than impeachment right off the bat. On the other hand, we've got Robert Mueller's investigation still hanging over this White House. Uh, it, 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 there have been reports that he might uh, issue some kind of report as early as February, but who knows? It's sort of a black box that not a lot of us have a window into in the moment. Uh, once some evidence comes out, whatever Robert Mueller knows that we don't, then you, you might get a little more uh, incentive for House Democrats to seriously look at impeachment. But at the moment, uh, it, it's premature. The House Democratic leadership don't want to talk about it. Articles of impeachment have been introduced by Congressman Brad Sherman, a longtime Democrat from Los Angeles, but it's not likely that that's going to go anywhere, especially because the political reality is the Republicans control the Senate, and there's simply not the votes in the Senate uh, to remove him from office, even if he were impeached. Reed Wilson, we're only into the first week of 2019, and all of this, who knows what the rest of the year will hold. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Next, a lawyer for Paul Whelan, the dual US-British citizen charged by Russia with espionage, is appealing his detention without bail. It comes as Britain warned Moscow against playing a diplomatic chess game. Mr Whelan's multiple nationalities have increased the focus on his case. If found guilty of the charges, which he denies, he could face up to 20 years in prison. From Moscow, the BBC's Sarah Rainsford reports. Paul Whelan was with a wedding party staying at this top-end Moscow hotel but he never made it to the ceremony. He was arrested, charged as a spy. Russia's security service implied he'd been caught red-handed. As his family and friends insist he's innocent, the British government says it's extremely worried. Individuals should not be used as pawns of diplomatic leverage. And, um, you know, we need to see what these charges are against him, uh, understand whether there is a case or not. Uh, we are giving every support that we can. So what do we know about Paul Whelan? He was a reserve in the US Marines for 14 years and served two tours in Iraq. In 2008, he was discharged for bad conduct, theft, according to military records. But it was from Iraq that he made his first trip to Russia in 2006. Paul Whelan's had a page on this Russian social media site now for over a decade and he's got dozens of friends on here. Now because this is a spy case, the ones I've contacted have been too nervous to go on camera to speak openly about him. But they have been messaging and they've described a man who they say is very interested in Russia and in its culture, not in its secrets. In fact, one man told me if Paul Whelan is a spy, then I'm Michael Jackson. 
There are men on here who do have military connections, but even those men have told me that Mr Whelan never asked them anything suspicious. His twin brother says Paul Whelan had been showing wedding guests around the Kremlin on the day of his arrest. It's very hard for me to understand how anyone would consider Paul to be someone who would be a lawbreaker and take those sorts of risks, uh, particularly in countries where uh, they're less um, maybe flexible about lawbreaking. He's now in solitary confinement in this former KGB prison. There's still no official word what exactly he's accused of. Instead, there's speculation this could be part of a bigger political game, one that now involves Britain as well as Russia and America. So might Vladimir Putin himself be involved? Last month, he condemned the detention of a Russian woman, Maria Butina, in the United States. She's accused of trying to build back channels to Republicans for her government ahead of the U.S. elections. So might Russia be banking on a prisoner swap? Either way, this latest crisis threatens to cool Russia's relations with the West even further. At its heart is a man facing a potential 20-year prison sentence for espionage. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Moscow. Well, for more on this case, I spoke a brief time ago to Shane Harris, who covers national security and intelligence matters for the Washington Post. And I began by asking if the multiple countries now applying pressure will make a difference. Well, I think it's quite significant because now Paul Whelan has these multiple avenues of diplomatic uh, approach that he can make to try to get help for his situation in Russia. So he has the U.S. government, but also the Canadian, the British government, the Irish government now. And, and notably, he appears to have been trying to avail himself of all those available channels, which might be an indication of what he sees as the, the, you know, the severity of his situation. Now, we've heard from the U.K. Foreign Secretary uh, accusing uh, the Russians of using uh, Whelan as a political pawn. We've not had a stronger response from the US so far. Um, how would you assess the US diplomatic response? It's curious to me that the Secretary Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, uh, issued a kind of cautionary statement or a conditional one, maybe is a better way to put it, where he said essentially if these allegations prove to be untrue or if the arrest was unjust, then we'll take some action. It's customary to see uh, a, a head of the State Department kind of come out and forcefully advocate for the interest of a U.S. citizen who is being held. So that was a little bit strange. And notably, the Whelan family today issued a statement in which they said they were urging the State Department and members of Congress to get involved here. It's unusual, too, to see the family having to publicly urge their own government to try to take some action on behalf of an American citizen. And nothing from President Trump, either. No, he hasn't said anything at all. Uh, and obviously we know about his own particular affinities and views on Russia. Uh, but he has not, although he's had his hands full here with the government shut down and the fight over the border wall as well. How do you think this plays into the wider tensions between the U.S. and Russia? I think it will only exacerbate what are already, you know, very high tensions between the two governments, if not between the two leaders. Anytime another country uh, takes a citizen, arrests them, accuses them of espionage, uh, it, it can lead to incredible tension. We saw that here in the U.S. when the United States arrested and then prosecuted the Russian woman Maria Butina, uh, who ultimately pled guilty to charges of acting as an agent uh, for Russia in the United States. Uh, some people I've talked to, particularly former CIA officials, view this arrest of Whelan as a kind of tit-for-tat of the United States prosecuting Putin. So it's another ratcheting up of the tensions between the two countries. And what do you think happens now? I mean, he's currently being held in solitary confinement. Uh, what do you think needs to happen next? Well, the next question ultimately is going to be what precisely are the allegations against him? The Russian government's definition of espionage in its law is quite broad and elastic, so we still don't know exactly what he's accused of doing. All we've seen have come in the form of press leaks so far, uh, so that's number one. Uh, and then number two is what exactly was Paul Whelan doing in Russia? We do know that he traveled there quite a number of times. He spoke Russian, uh, but his employers, uh, particularly uh, where he has worked in corporate security for the past several years, have both now said uh, that he was doing no business in Russia on the company's behalf. So why was he there? Who was he connected to? Why does the Russian government think that he was engaged in espionage? That's a huge question to answer right now. Lots of questions still unanswered. Shane Harris, thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you.
Let's take a look at some of the other news from around the world. The United Nations has criticised the trial of the men accused of murdering Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The UN says there needs to be an independent international investigation into the killing. Mr Khashoggi, who was a prominent critic of the Saudi government, was killed after entering the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, in October. The US State Department urged Americans to exercise increased caution when travelling to China after a spate of high-profile detentions, including Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver. Canada's revealed that 11 other Canadians have been detained since the 1st of December, the day a top Chinese executive, Meng Guangzhou, of the Chinese telecoms firm Huawei, was arrested in Canada at the request of US prosecutors. Huawei, meanwhile, has punished two of its staff for using mobile phones made by its American rival Apple. The employees tweeted New Year's greetings from Huawei's official account, which came with the message via Twitter for iPhone. The Chinese companies reportedly demoted the two workers and reduced their salaries, accusing them of damaging the brand. Thousands of people in southern Thailand are fleeing the path of the worst tropical storm to hit the area in 30 years. Storm Paybook made landfall in the early hours of the morning local time, sending trees crashing into houses. Thousands of people have left the islands of Koh Samui and Koh Phan Yang. The storm then targeted the south of the country, affecting more popular tourist spots. Our World Affairs editor John Simpson reports from the north of Koh Samui. This was just the start of it. Superstorm Pabuk, meaning giant catfish, is, in the words of Thailand's meteorological head, simply huge. It hit the two northerly islands hard early on in the day. By noon, it was starting to close down the island of Koh Samui as well. The roads were empty of traffic and winds of 50 miles an hour or more were blowing down trees close to the sea. The emergency services were out in force, though in the hours of daylight the number of injuries was still quite small and only two deaths had been reported. Yesterday, thousands of visitors, Thai as well as foreign, tried to get off the islands while they still could. But some stayed, either because they couldn't leave or perhaps because they wanted to see what was going to happen. Uh, Sam and Miranda uh, Abidaya from Chester came to Koh Samui to celebrate his 30th birthday. birthday. We were able to uh, get out and stock up pretty quickly. So we, we've filled the room full of food. We've got as much protective mattresses up, taping the windows, doing whatever we can to keep the room safe um, and, and really just riding it out. To be honest, no one really knows what's going to be happening the next few hours. The weather seems to be changing all the time. The rain, which was drenching just a few minutes ago, has suddenly stopped, but the wind has come up pretty fiercely. Tonight, though, the storm proper is just about to hit Koh Samui. What's certain is that this superstorm is highly unusual for this time of year. John Simpson, BBC News, Koh Samui in Thailand. You're watching BBC World News America. Still to come on tonight's programme, how concerned should parents be over the amount of time their children spend in front of a screen? New guidelines may well surprise you. Hundreds of politicians and leading figures in Germany have had their personal details exposed in a massive data breach. Contact information, private chats and even credit card details were hacked. This is the largest breach of personal data that Germany has ever seen. Hundreds of politicians have been hit by this attack, including German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Germany's president. Also, top celebrities have been affected, including an actor, a TV comedian, various singers and rappers. What they all have in common is that many of them have been very critical of right-wing extremism. That has meant that many people are now thinking that possibly the people behind this attack are indeed right-wing extremists. The other reason for that supposition is that the only political party not to be affected is the populist right-wing AFD, Alternative for Germany.
Doctors in the UK say there's no firm evidence that spending time on smartphones, computer screens and tablets is harmful to children's health in itself. But while the guidance avoids setting any screen time limits, it does recommend not using them in the hour before bedtime. Our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh has more. How much screen time via smartphones, computers or TV is OK for kids? These children from Beckenham in South London have strict limits set by their mum, including no screens before bedtime. Yeah, I think that's really fine, because I play on it. I always play on it, really. <laughs> I have a computer upstairs, and that's where I do a lot of my homework on. But, like, in my free time, when I'm not doing, like, homework and training, I'm, like, it's calm to just, like, chill out on my phone. If I think back to when I was young, I think, the thing for us was TV, you know, we we're on TV too much, we watch TV, what was it going to do to us? It didn't, I think it's just a new medium. I think tablets, it's a new medium, it's a new generation and this is their, how they, you know, spend their time. I don't think it's bad, I think anything, nothing is bad in moderation. Today's guidance says as long as children are active and healthy, then parents are best placed to decide what screen use is appropriate and there's no need for set time limits. That there's not good enough evidence for a particular threshold and it's really difficult to pick a number here. The second is actually applying a threshold is very difficult. What about homework? What about educational things? What about piano practice with your, with your uh, music on, a, on an iPad? It's very difficult to actually put these things in practice and often what happens is it just makes people feel bad about what are quite normal activities. Many studies have shown an association between high screen use and obesity and depression. But the Royal College says there's simply not enough evidence to show a direct causal link. It might be that children with those issues are more likely to use screens excessively. In its guidance, the Royal College recommends families ask themselves four questions. Is screen time in your household controlled? Does it interfere with what your family wants to do? Does it interfere with sleep? And are you able to control snacking during screen time? The child health experts say there is a need for better research, especially on the effects of social media. So this guidance could change in years to come. One thing they are sure of is that children should not use screens in the hour before bedtime, because the light can slow the release of the sleep-inducing hormone melatonin. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. Now for my favourite story of the day. World War I brought many social changes, but here's one you might not know much about. The introduction of jazz to Europe. It was thanks to an African-American regiment of musicians known as the Harlem Hellfighters that the French were exposed to the music's signature sound. Well, to mark the 100th anniversary of the war's end, a number of musical tributes are raising fresh awareness of the Hellfighters and their leader, James Reese Europe. Jane O'Brien has their story. When America entered World War I, the 369th Black Infantry Regiment was sent to France. Better known as the Harlem Hellfighters, they were also musicians. And when they set foot on the continent, jazz came with them. When the French audience hears them for the first time, they're like, what is this music? How does this sound like this, you know? Can I see your instrument? You must be doing something tricky with it to make it sound this way. One hundred years later, the sound of the Hellfighters has been reproduced by young musicians from historically black colleges. This performance at the Kennedy Center is part of efforts to rekindle awareness of their legacy, and in particular, their leader, James Reese Europe. Europe was already a famous musician in New York. His complex melodies and driving rhythms had helped establish black music, as it was known then. Jason Moran has created a tribute to Europe with a new work based on some of his compositions. How do you freshen that up then and make you know, it sound contemporary? The, the way that, um, that I like to think about this one, we also play it fast for a while and in, in my band we play it kind of messy. <laughs> so that's the one way, right, is to show the mess in all this.
over the one hour that we present this, this work, we present a history to James Reese Europe. This is how we feel about you. This is how we want to honor your work. This is how it feels to us today. Europe survived the war and returned to America to rave reviews. But a few months later, he was stabbed in the neck by his drummer and died aged 39. Forgotten for so long, he is now remembered as one of the great masters of jazz. Jane O'Brien, BBC News, Washington. The legacy of James Reese Europe and the Harlem Hellfighters. What a great way to end the show. I'm Regine Vaidenarden. Thanks very much for watching us here at BBC World News America.